think one of the things that America has to face is the reality that it is an empire. No, you must use it. You must use it because it make you rebel against what? They were in front of Radio Eight, shooting at the station. No es un crimen defender nuestros propios derechos como pueblos indígenas. Greetings and blessings. You're listening to the November edition of the Travelog Media Podcast. I'm Jason Clarell, podcasting from Quetzaltenango, Guatemala. Thanks for listening. On this edition, the coup in Bolivia and remembering N30, 20 years ago, the anti-WTO protests in Seattle, 1999. Stay tuned. All right, thanks again for joining me. If you're sick of hearing about the coup in Bolivia, great. Uh, that means you're paying attention, and you can skip ahead to part two of the program. If you didn't know there was a coup in Bolivia, allow me to inform you there was a coup in Bolivia. I'm honored to be the first to bring you some information that runs counter to the corporate media propaganda launched this week in an effort to dominate the narrative but we wouldn't let that happen, would we? First, um, the facts. Uh, on November 10, Evo Morales, the first indigenous president of Bolivia, was forced to resign in a coup led by members of the Bolivian military, police, and opposition party. He was able to board a plane to Mexico, where President Andres Manuel Lope, Lopez Obrador, or AMLO, has granted him asylum. Coup leaders have rounded up elected members of MAS, kidnapping family members to force their resignation, renew, removed and burned the Wipala flag, ransacked Morales' home, and in the days following the coup, racist Senator Janine Añez, whose party only received 4% of the vote in the last election, illegally declared herself president. The military has since taken full advantage of total impunity by murdering several protesters in the ensuing unrest. How lovely. And now some tweets. On November 10, journalist Anya Parampil tweeted, U.S. State Department officially praises Alm Almagro and his OAS goon squad for their work to invalidate Bolivia's democratic process. The U.S. provides 60% of OAS budget. Almagro works as a proud servant of the org Fidel once called the Yankee Ministry of the Colonies. The same day she tweeted out a video of her appearance on Al Jazeera English. I note on Al Jazeera English that Yankee Minister Almagro has sat idly by while Hondurans protest their narco dictator Juan Orlando Hernandez. We cannot trust him nor the OAS when they claim to stand for democracy in Bolivia. Hashtag Evo Presidente Legitimo. Here's the audio from that interview. The Supreme Court ruled that Evo Morales had the right to run for this term. So I believe the, cons the, the question of, of term limits is a distraction from the question of who actually won the October 20th election. We should talk about the Organization for American States, which under the leadership of Luis Almagro, the former foreign minister of Uruguay, has become a complete tool of the United States. I've covered it very closely from here in Washington. We don't hear Luis Almagro denouncing, for example, Juan Orlando Hernandez, the president of Honduras, who has also been uh, protested for years, but especially over the last several months after his brother was implicated in a multi-million dollar cocaine and drug running scandal in the United States. He was actually found guilty of running drugs and guns to the U.S., and that president is named as a co-conspirator in the case, yet Luis Almagro is silent about Honduras. He's silent about Chile, where we saw security forces systematically targeting demonstrators and shooting them mm. in the eyes. And that's because the OAS is only 
only interested in carrying out the policies of Washington. Washington pays for 60 percent of that organization's budget. And I would urge viewers and journalists alike to read a report recently issued by the Center for Economic and Policy Research, a very fine and credible think tank based here in Washington, which looked at claims by the OAS about voting irregularities and, and, and um, fraud allegations of fraud in the Bolivian elections and found that there were no actual credible pieces of evidence to suggest that this vote was invalid. 47 percent of Bolivians on October 20th voted for Evo Morales. And we should remember that Evo Morales came to become, came to be the presidency in 2003 on the backs of a social movement that was standing up to Carlos Mesa himself. He was president, vice president, after and, and the, the former president, Gonzalo Sanchez de la Zora, was forced to resign for massacring demonstrators standing up to protect their national resource, their national, natural and national resources. Evo was among those demonstrators, and he rode a massive social movement of working people, of peasants, of farmers into power. Those people will not hearing, disappear, even if Morales, even if Morales has forced to step down. That is why he said at the end of his statement today, la vida no terminado aquí, la lucha sigue. Life doesn't end here. The fight continues. And we'll see that in Bolivia. And the international community should be paying attention because there is a possibility now that the poor and the poor supporters of Evo Morales in Bolivia will be targeted with violence, as we've seen already what these demonstrators are doing. They're surrounding the Venezuelan embassy. They've surrounded state TV services. They've been acting in a way that if it were in any other country, the U.S., Washington, the Organization of American States would be, announcing, be denouncing the demonstrators. But in this case, because they want to undermine the democratic will of the Bolivian people, they have stood behind these very violent and clearly fascist demonstrators. And you, we'll have to leave it there. Of course, so many questions still to be answered and this situation is playing out as we speak. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Okay. And, um, and on November 11th, <clears throat> Author Naomi Klein tweeted, Exactly 10 years ago, Evo Morales negotiators went to a UN climate summit and called for a Marshall Plan for planet Earth and rights for Mother Earth. The idea was what is now being called a hashtag Green New Deal. If we had listened then, the world might not be in flames. The Intercept journalist Glenn Greenwald retweeted it with the comment, there's literally not a single thing about the violence and military rule taking place in Boliv Bolivia that is about restoration of democracy. Everything that's happening is about an end to democracy there. A classic coup. It's astonishing U.S. media outlets won't call it that. And we also heard from some members of com uh, the U.S. Congress. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted, What's happening right now in Bolivia isn't democracy, it's a coup. The people of Bolivia deserve free, fair, and peaceful elections, not violent seizures of power. Ilhan Omar tweeted, There's a word for the president of a, of a country being pushed out by, mili by the military. It's called a coup. We must unequivocally oppose political violence in Bolivia. Bolivians deserve free and fair elections. Gray Zone Project journalist Ben Norton tweeted out a video of Bernie Sanders responding to a question about Evo Morales. Who wrote in a tweet that, that you thought it was a military to yes. coup what happened in, in, in yeah. Bolivia. Many people have other point of view. They think that Evo Morales had been in power 14 years, yep. that he wanted to fight more, and that he wanted to become a dictator. So uh, what do you think? No, I don't agree with that late, uh, assertion. I, I think Morales, <laughs> Morales did a very good job in alleviating poverty, in giving the indigenous people of Bolivia a voice that they never had before. Now, we can argue about his going for a fourth term, whether that was a wise thing to do. And they always thought it was a fraud, the election on October the 20th. Some people think that as well. But at the end of the day, it was the military who intervened in that process and asked them to leave. When the military intervenes, well, hey, in my view, that's called a coup. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all. Norton also tweeted, Bolivian coup, quote unquote, President Añez's far right party MDS got 4% of the vote in the 2019 election. Venezuela coup, quote unquote, President Guaido's far right party Voluntad Popular got 3% of the vote 
in the 2012 election and then boycotted future elections. They could never win without a U.S. coup. And of course, what U.S.-backed coup and propaganda campaign would be complete without a Twitter bot storm? Shortly after the coup, if you typed in friends from everywhere in Bolivia, there was no coup. You were likely to see hundreds of fake accounts all echoing the same phrase. The unmistakable work of a bot. And finally, let's close this segment with a tweet from SOA Watch, which again, in case you forgot, SOA is School of the Americas, which is now known as WinSec. SOA Watch tweeted, 30 years after the massacre at the UCA, UCA in El Salvador, the need to close SOA slash WinSec and end the U.S. policy it represents as, an, as, as urgent as ever. The U.S.-backed coup in Bolivia involving WinSec grad General Kaliman and five other SOA grads has unleashed a massacre against the Bolivian people. Okay, after a short break, we'll come back and talk about some of the media coverage. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can show your support by listening on the Radio Public app on your Android or Apple device. Look for the link in the show notes for details on how to download the free Radio Public app. Or if you prefer to make a direct donation, you can visit paypal.me slash jskmedia. Your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts are always appreciated, but even better, it's telling a friend about Travelog Media. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. All right, thanks for listening to the Travelog Media Podcast. I'd like to <clears throat> share with you some more, some of the more recent pieces on the Bolivia coup, which is now just over a week old as I record this on November 19th. Uh, the first is from popularresistance.org on November 17, called Bolivia's De Facto Government Grants Impunity to Police Armed Forces. This is reported by Telesur. They write... The de facto government of Bolivia issued a decree Saturday exempting armed forces and poli national police from criminal responsibility when committing acts of repression against protesters who have taken to the streets to reject the coup d'etat. Quote, to the, personal, the personnel of the armed forces who participate in the operations for the restoration of order and public stability will be exempt from criminal responsibility when, in compliance with their constitutional functions, they act in legitimate defense or state of necessity, the decree reads. Unquote. Um, as we've seen since the coup, uh, there's been ample evidence on social media of the massacre that's taken place. Telesur, who have been probably doing the most extensive reporting from Bolivia, report at least 24 have been killed. Clearly, those rogue forces are not interested in, quote, legitimate defense or state of necessity. Okay, so if you're wondering who are these people that orchestrated the, this coup, I recommend you check out the reporting by Max Blumenthal and Ben Norton at thegrayzone.com. They break it down in a piece on the, uh, with the headline, Bolivia Coup Led by Christian Fascist Paramilitary Leader and Millionaire with foreign support, writing, The presidential candidate Bolivia's opposition had fi fielded in the October election, Carlos Mesa, is a, quote, pro-business privatizer with extensive ties to Washington. U.S. government cables published by WikiLeaks reveal that he regularly co corresponded with Ar American officials in their efforts to destabilize Morales. Mesa is currently listed as an expert in the inter-American dialogue, a D.C.-based think tank funded by the U.S. government's soft power arm, USAID, various oil giants, and a host of multinational corporations active in Latin America. The article later continues, Luis Fernando Camacho was groomed by the Union Juvenil Cruceñista, or Santa Cruz Youth U Union, UJC, a fascist paramilitary organization that has been linked to assassination plots against Morales. The group is notorious for assaulting leftists, indigenous presents, and journalists, all while espousing a deeply racist, homophobic ideology. Since Morales entered office in 2006, the UJC has campaigned to separate, to separate from a country its members believed 
have been overtaken by a satanic indigenous mass. The UJC is the Bolivian equivalent of Spain's Falange, India's Hindu supremacist RSS, and Ukraine's neo-Nazi Azov Battalion. Its symbol is a green cross that bears strong similarities to logos of fascist movements across the West, and its members are known to launch into Nazi-style Sieg Heil salutes. Right, okay, so if you're thinking this coup was about restoring democracy, maybe not so much. So what about the U.S. involvement? Um, In an article by Danny Haifang for popularresistance.org called... In Bolivia, the American empire struck back. He connects some of the dots between USAID and various other actors that help keep Latin America in line with Washington. And interestingly, he mentions the Monroe Doctrine, of course. He writes, quote, After over a century of U.S. imperial aggression, Evo Morales arose as one of the most revolutionary leaders of the movement for socialism in the 21st century in Latin America, a movement that gained significant traction after the, re-election, after the election of former Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez in 1998, MAS has been in power since 2006. The MAS has acted as a vehicle for workers and peasants to assert their dignity and self-determination. Trade union, indigenous, and women's organizations have all played a major role in the, impl- in the implementation of social policy under Evo's leadership. Economic, economic growth in Bolivia has increased by an average of 5% a year, with many of the gains distributed to the indigenous populations formerly dispossessed by centuries of colonial and neocolonial rule. Extreme poverty has been cut in half over the same period. Um, Well, there's a lot more I was going to add about uh, corporate media's recasting the coup to make it seem as though this were some sort of victory for democracy. But let me just include one more quote from Fair's piece called Western Media Whitewash, Bolivia's Far-Right Coup. It's by Lucas Kerner and Ricardo Vaz. Quote, Meanwhile, corporate outlets have euphemistically labeled Agnes as quote-unquote conservative, eliding any mention of her far-right virulently anti-indigenous politics. Añez is a member of the right-wing democratic social movement from the eastern lowland region of Santa Cruz, historically a bastion of separatist groups and home to some of the most powerful Bolivian oligarchic families. She has a history of making glaringly racist remarks, tweeting in 2013 that the Aymara New Year, an indigenous holiday, was satanic. There's no replacement for God. Just days before seizing power, she questioned on Twitter whether some people believing uh, some people being interviewed could really be indigenous because they were wearing shoes for all of liberal journalists virtue signaling concerning minority rights in the global north the silence is deafening when it comes to blatant racism from pro us elites in latin america let's go to a music break and we'll return with a look back 20 years ago to the famous battle of seattle
Okay, welcome back, and thanks for listening to the Travelog Media Podcast. In the second half of the show, we'll take a look at the anti-WTO protest that took place 20 years ago in Seattle, Washington. The WTO ministerial meetings scheduled for November 1999 drew protest protesters from all corners of the globe. Trade unions, NGOs, environmental groups, anarchists, student groups, and other activists rallied to shut down the talks. So <clears throat> I'd like to commemorate the 20th anniversary of this significant event by sharing a few clips from one of the documentary films made of the events. It's called Showdown in Seattle. Uh, in the opening of the film, uh, Kevin Donahar of Global Exchange says, quote, I think it's a very telling fact that you can go out in the street anywhere in the United States and ask people to give you one sentence about the World Trade Organization, and they won't be able to say one intellig intelligible sentence about what it is, where it's based, what it does, when it was created, whose interests it serves, whose interests it hurts, unquote. Yeah, um, although I can't say for sure, I suspect that's just as true 20 years later. However, it's interesting to note that, uh, at least the last time I checked, the WTO hasn't held a meeting on U.S. soil since those protests. Anyway, let's listen to some clips from the film, which, of course, I'll link to in the show notes. You're in the ring in the streets of Seattle because you're not in the WTO in the ivory tower. And I want to welcome, this is where you belong, right here with the labor movement. I think it's making history and it's exciting and it's been very exciting to see the labor movement come together and really enforce be out there and send a message to people that we are against the WTO. What is going to come out is that the message has been sent all across the world and all across the United States. What we're going to see is that people are getting energized. I'm a, a member of Earth First and we work to protect the environment and we recently entered into an alliance with the steel workers. We have an alliance for sustainable jobs in the environment and we're completely tired of, of we don't buy into this, you know, there's jobs and environment thing. We want them both, we deserve them both, and we need them both. The Lawyers Guild and a lot of other people actually have trained legal observers to be out in the community and not to really be involved with the demonstrations, in fact to stay somewhat removed from them, but to be able to be in very good positions to observe, especially to observe the behavior of the police. They've been ripping uh, gas masks off people's faces. They have apparently, we've heard rumor, uh, found it to be um, under martial law to be against the law for anyone other than police to have um, tear gas or gas helmets on and so they're ripping them off people. Well, I heard there was something about a mayor saying there's a mayoral decree saying you couldn't have signs, protest signs. Right, they've also removed protest signs from people, anything that declares any kind of um, opinion about the WTO is being removed from people. I think the basis of it is this uh, state of emergency where Mayor Shell said that if people are seen within this certain region and they engage in protests, they'll be considered automatically to be doing something unlawful. It's really a fairly blatant suspension of the constitutionally protected rights to, to assemble and to speak. So, you know, when that spins into, well, now you can't even own a gas mask, now you can't own a banner, now you can't own a, a protest button, you know, it seems that those can't possibly be restrictions on people that have any basis in the Constitution. Orders, they gave the orders to move forward. We were standing there asking to go through, we did not revoke them. And I saw them pepper spray her directly, and they tear gassed all of us. I saw them push her down and walk through her. <laughs> We had a rally down at the docks and we went through the Pike Market and came up to the corner and saw those police chasing the kids down the street. These are the same kids that have been marching with us. They weren't doing anything wrong. And they were tear gassing them and I've never seen it before and I said, well, I'm going to stick around and watch it. Now they tear gassed us and now they pepper sprayed us. I 
think so much was done that was so blatantly illegal and so blatantly abusive. Um, I think many, many, many courts could could find in the favor of people who were who were victimized, whose rights were violated, whose bodies were brutalized, and you know, I suppose it depends on the court, but. Mm -hmm. They're not marginal legal issues, they're pretty clear, you know. I'm, I'm just so ashamed of my country right now. I'm crying because I got pepper gas, but I'd cry anyway. I mean, it's... <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the legacies from Seattle 99 has been the Independent Media Center, which was formed to counter the dominant corporate media narrative, which tended to flatten all protesters, a wide coalition, into a handful of violent thugs causing property damage. And of course, this continues to this very day in corporate media when it comes to silencing dissent. Um... And it's a tool used to justify the violence and repressive tactics used by police. And in fact, the increasing militarization of police forces in the U.S. Uh, so let's go now to a clip on the IMC. The main motivation for us uh, starting the Independent Media Center was folks on the ground here in Seattle recognizing the importance of this issue and also all, that all these tremendous, brilliant, articulate people were coming from all over the world to speak truth to power here, to confront globalization and its anti-democratic agenda. One of the critical aspects to uh, this center is that it's been a clearinghouse of information for lots of individuals, not only who live in Seattle, but have been coming in from around the country and around the globe um, to participate in the events this week. And uh, we are providing a base of operation for journalists and others who are going out into the streets and capturing the content editing the content and then distributing it over the internet, over satellite, over faxes, uh, literally around the world. We have to find our own ways to get the message out. So because the revolution will not be televised by the corporate media, we hope that the information that has been presented to you by the alternative media is one that you will learn. What's, what's really important to note about the whole center that's taking place is that um, it's, it's, it's fairly unprecedented. We've got teams that are covering video, we've got teams that are covering, covering print, we have a newspaper actually being published every day out of this center. The, the blind spot, which is this paper, it's the paper that the independent media center puts out every day um, during the WTO and it's basically like a 11 by 17 fold over that's front and back and which is pretty much all we can afford to do. I'm sure we could fill a lot more of it at this point. And this was today's headline. We will stop this war against the earth. We will stop the war against the small farmers. We will stop the war against our bodies. All right. Um, I, I wasn't at the night, uh, Seattle 1999 protest, but I did get involved in the North Carolina IMC during the Bush regime. And you could say that had a lot to do with my, with what motivates me to continue doing this podcast. Um, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you think someone else might like it, please share and please do check out all the links in the show notes. That does it for this episode of the Travelog Media Podcast. Music for this episode by Spinmeister. You can find Travelog Media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. And I would really appreciate it if you downloaded the Radio Public app and listened to new episodes there. And if you're a new listener and you listen to three episodes, I get a special deal from Radio Public. I get a little bonus, so it's quite nice. Uh, and of course, uh, I'd always love to hear your comments. You can reach out anytime on social media or by email at podcast 
at Travelog Media. Que todo sea amor, walk tall, live free. <laughs>